I place a lot of value in boss fights. They can prove to be an excellent game mechanic and narrative tool. A boss should be the ultimate challenge, putting everything you've learned at the stage to its test. Super Mario Bros. codified a lot of how we understand bosses with Bowser, testing how you overcome most enemies with a large opponent, and later testing how you can handle the Hammer Brothers. In story-driven games, defeating a boss can be very satisfying in a narrative sense. The Yakuza series will build up characters for Kiryu to fight, and seeing them get taken down leads to a lot of satisfaction. This is in part of why I love Kingdom Hearts so much. The series uses the player's familiarity with villains such as Hades, Maleficent, and Ursula to further motivate you to defeat them. The ultimate example would be Kefka Palazzo of Final Fantasy VI. Kefka has personally wronged the majority of the cast, and has done some very heinous acts that the player will likely build animosity for him. Dark Souls is a series that excels in its boss fights, and the games wouldn't be the same without them. There are many great boss fights in this series, and I could go on forever about my favorites. The standouts from the first Dark Souls includes Great Wolf Sif, Artorias, Manus, Ornstein and Smo, fuck you Michael, the Bell Gargoyles, and Gwyn himself. But Dark Souls, for how great of a game it is, suffers from the effects of a rushed development. It's not as apparent as other examples, but after the Lord Vessel is obtained, the tightness in the level design slacks. The Duke's Archives, Tomb of the Giants, and New Londo Ruins are the most well-designed of the post-Lord Vessel game, but the former two have the problem where they lack the interconnectivity of the other areas. This is especially glaring with the Tomb of the Giants, since it does show the Demon Ruins in Ash Lake. Another example of rush development would be the balancing and design of the bosses. I don't need to tell you that the Bed of Chaos is not the greatest boss in the world. I don't need to tell you that the Demon Fire Sage is a rehash of the Stray Demon, which is a rehash of the Asylum Demon. But I feel that bosses like Nido or the Centipede Demon could have been better handled and thus more memorable. But let's start discussing the man you've all been waiting for! You know him! You love him! His Pinwheel! Pinwheel is the boss of the catacombs and is infamous in the Dark Souls community for being, well, a complete joke. He's got low health, he doesn't have very dangerous attacks, and his gimmick of making fake duplicates doesn't work out for him all that well. Most players tend to tackle the catacombs after an Orlando, and given the open nature of the game up to that point, Pinwheel can be among the last bosses you face, and if so, you're guaranteed to steamroll him. But here's the question, is that how it's supposed to be? Technically speaking, Penriel is one of the first bosses you can face after clearing the Undead Asylum, and there's nothing stopping you from progressing through the catacombs, besides common sense and the skeleton hordes. And this is by design. If you're a faith-based character, going to the catacombs and the Tomb of the Giants early is to your benefit, as Rhea of Thoroughland will sell you miracles after you save her. Dark Souls trust the player to know where they want to go. If you can toughen up for the catacombs, the game won't stop you from regressing all the way through the Tomb of the Giants up to Nito's tomb. So Dark Souls, as a 3D Metroidvania, allows the player to face bosses in any order they choose. That means you can face Pinwheel as early or as late as you choose. I decided to do an experiment. I used three characters. I used a Dex Intelligence character who will make Pinwheel his third to last boss fight. In theory, this character will be so overpowered from all the experiences in the game that he'll be able to one-shot Pinwheel with a Crystal Soul Spear. For this video, I specifically made a knight who eventually becomes a paladin. He tackles the catacombs right after the Capra Demon, and as for my third character, well, she heads straight to the catacombs after the bird drops her off. Who is this character? Why, she's a simple bandit, but eventually she will become... The LEGEND! The bandit starts out with the highest strength among the starting classes. With a plunging attack, you essentially take half of the Asylum Demon's health. Immediately after landing in Lordran, the bandit takes a running start into the world's anus. 
Despite how spooky the skeletons are, the bandit manages to slay the nearby necromancer after manipulating the world to her advantage. This is where the bandit is in a bit of a bind. The skeletons are very powerful with this little bugger, and she makes multiple attempts to skip all of the catacombs, but ends up falling into the abyss, blown up by wisps, burnt by an old man boner, or just killed by a freaking skeleton. The bandit, left undead by her multiple attempts to reach the bottom, cannot summon the Way of White's paladin. So she braves the wheel skeletons alone and faces Pinwheel. Despite all of the bandit's strength, she is unable to vanquish Pinwheel and is killed. I'll either have to bash my head in over and over until Pinwheel gives up, or swallow my pride and summon... <laughs> ...who absolutely trivializes this fight. Actually, this scenario may be why Leroy is here at all. Why make one of the strongest summons available to one of the weakest bosses? For the dumbasses who make Pinwheel their first boss! But it's not satisfying to watch an NPC kill a boss for you. And while it can make it slightly more difficult with Pinwheel getting a health boost, Leroy is so powerful he'll still end up doing most of the work. I mean, I looked away and he two-shot at Pinwheel. What the fuck? Obviously, tackling Pinwheel right out of the gate isn't the smartest of ideas. So let's try the other extreme! Behold, a sorcerer of Vinheim who has adorned himself as a partner of Velka with his Moonlight Greatsword, a Velka Rapier, and Logan's own catalyst. He ventures through the land of Lordran, slaying all beasts in his path, and he will... Two-shot pinwheel. Oh, wow, I was hoping that I would one-shot him. But still, this is an extreme. I know I saved Pinwheel until last, but a Crystal Soul Spear taking out two-thirds of his health is still insane! So, it's clear that if I want to have a satisfying match against Pinwheel, I'm gonna have to reconsider where and when I should face the Skeleton Necromancer. What about after Quaylog? It makes some semblance of sense. You could venture from Blighttown to the Catacombs after talking with Frampt? But I still found this to be an unchallenging experience for the character I used. I was made too powerful from the Gaping Dragon, Blighttown, and Quaylog herself. I needed to face Pinwheel even earlier. While doing research for this video, I found someone suggesting that Pinwheel can be tackled after the Capper Demon, using the game's soundtrack as evidence. You see, Pinwheel has his own song, a very haunting theme that is unlike any other. An electric shamisen played over maddening chanting. Followed by a lone flute. And later a singing woman and a violin. This track is listed after the Bell Gargoyles and before the Gaping Dragon. So does that indicate when the developers intended or expected the players would hear this song and thus face Pinwheel? I decided to put this to the test with a brand new character. The knight is a slow-moving tank, wielding a shield and broadsword. Even if he can't kill someone in one or two hits, it won't matter with the amount of armor he's wearing. The knight is a member of the Way of White and aspires to be as powerful as Paladin Leroy. He greets Petrus of Thurlin, but knows that Petrus is a cheap-ass bitch and declines to purchase any miracles for a time. The knight ventures out to Undead Burg and takes care of the undead with little effort. The only ones who put up a challenge for our brave knight are the Black Knight and the Taurus Demon, and both fall to his blade. He is invaded once by a friendly fellow who gifts him a handful of Titanite shards and chunks after beating him to death a little. He ventures out to the bridge where the Hellkite Drake dabs on the bridge. Our knight is diligent and he slips past the nasty Drake and picks up the Claymore. Though he enjoys the power that comes from the Claymore, it was eventually replaced with a bastard sword. Using this sword, the knight ventured into the forest and slayed the Moonlight Butterfly and acquired the Divine Flame and perished in the most embarrassing way possible. Afterwards, the knight overcame the Belgar coil, despite some setbacks. The knight returned to Undead Burg and went to Lower Undead Burg, where he faced the infamous Capra Demon and died. 
But then he kicked its ass the second time though. Now even though our knight holds the key to the depths, he decides to take a massive, MASSIVE detour back to Firelink Shrine and down into the catacombs. Though he intended on using a divine weapon, he didn't have any green titanite, and he also forgot about the Astora Straight Sword in the Valley of Drakes. But whatever, he powered through the catacombs, slaying necromancers and skeletons left and right. He made what many thought was a foolish decision to light the bonfire near Vamos, but he figured out how to face the wheel skeletons, who went down after a good slap of a bastard sword. When he was ready, our knight ventured to Pinwheel's domain. The bastard sword in his hands did a great damage to Pinwheel, but just as much to other bosses like the Gargoyles or old Capra. It was during this fight that I began to appreciate Pinwheel's boss fight and understand the mechanics behind him. Pinwheel creates duplicates of himself that fire spells as strong as he does, and while he does have pitiful amounts of health, if you take too long, the clones can overwhelm you. Near the end of the fight, I started panicking when Pinwheel summoned a dozen clones and they all started pelting me with fire spells. But thankfully, I put Pinwheel down before that could happen. This is the most fun I ever had fighting him, and it felt like a good climax to such a long level. So, what do we draw from this experience? Should we all just fight Pinwheel immediately after old Capra? Uh, well, not necessarily. For one, the Catacombs are still a very dangerous area, and I only felt comfortable venturing through them with a greatsword specifically to down skeletons. And for two, I don't think the game's balance is necessarily up to the player. I went into this to find when Pinwheel would be a fair challenge, designing my own experience based on knowledge of the game. And while I succeeded, that doesn't change the fact that Pinwheel is a poorly balanced boss fight. Developers should balance their games so that bosses and areas are tuned to the most optimal challenge. That isn't an easy feat, especially for simple games. And for Dark Souls, a 3D Metroidvania that is already a QA tester's nightmare, it's a guarantee that the developers recognize the flaws with Pinwheel, but chose to ship it as is. Time constraints can be necessary, but you can really see the consequences of what only two years of development can do. While I praise Pinwheel for making the player feel stress from facing an army of spellcasters, I think this concept has been performed better. Dark Lurker, despite being a headache to even face, does accomplish what I like about Pinwheel much better. Being a powerful spellcaster whoops the ante by spawning a doppelganger. That said, if you're at all curious, I recommend going into the catacombs earlier than you usually do. After going through it so many times, it has grown on me. I enjoy the level design and the unique challenge of killing a specific enemy to make the area easier. It's a similar experience to Blighttown with the blow dart fuckboys. The skeletons on their own aren't that bad, but their ability to swarm and bleed players makes them uniquely dangerous. I wouldn't call it the greatest level in Dark Souls, especially since it doesn't connect to other areas, which means you're always traveling in one direction. Anyways, my gushing about the catacombs means that I don't have a natural way to end this video. Fuck it. Damn it!